Okay, so uh, yeah, good evening everybody. Um, I would like to talk about the Oyster Lab um, and more specifically about the topic of uh, electric mobility because this is what we've been focusing on for the past couple of months. So we have been working on an e-mobility service that customers love and I would like to share with you how we did that. Um, before I do that, I would also like to, to thank uh, both the Impact Hub and uh, Stefan and the Yodoto team for making this happen for creating the space uh, because I think it's, it's really great uh, to, to yeah, connect to the community but also to share our wisdom because this is what we really like uh, as the as the also there. So on behalf of the entire team, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And be sure to, uh, to visit the websites. So, all right. So, a few words about myself. Um, so I'm actually an engineer. I worked in software engineering for quite some time. Uh, my greatest passions are to challenge the status quo, um, to build epic shit and to excite customers with that. And I have the great uh, opportunity right now to do exactly that as, uh, at the Oyster Lab. And I did that also before at uh, Zalando, where I was uh, the head of innovation and the head of uh, technology operations for the past five years, before I moved to Zurich about uh, seven, eight months ago. Um, and last but not least, I also spent some time in, in Japan. I just mentioned that because I think that this had a drastic impact on, on myself. Uh, because maybe you, you know, like, uh, philosophy of continuous improvement and Kaizen and total quality management. So they all come from Japan and I had the chance there to work also in a customer facing role and really learn what this means uh, in a working context. So again, I would like to first talk about the Oyster Lab. So why do we exist, uh, how do we work, what do we do? And thanks to, to Stefan, uh, last year we, we set it up together. The, uh, we call it innovation operating system that uh, kind of makes the safe space that we have today to, to be innovative and to be creative. Uh, and I would like to talk about the, the project that we're working on right now. We have other projects that we're working on, but Juka is like the, the main one that we focus on. And uh, I don't know about questions, uh, Stefan, if yeah. you have questions. Um, the, the plan is that we have the two talks, after that we grab some food and drinks, and then we have a little panel discussion where you can sh shout out any questions you have. Yeah? So maybe we have the talks and then the questions after them together. Okay. So the Oyster Lab, why do we exist? And uh, so the Oyster Lab is part of Alpic. Uh, I guess most of you know Alpic, who doesn't know Alpic? Okay, I think it's uh, one of the biggest energy companies in Switzerland. So energy producer, energy trader, energy provider. Uh, and just like many other energy companies has been struggling for quite some time because there's a huge transition going on in the, in the whole energy world. Uh, there's a strong push towards uh, renewables and decentralization. Um, so Alpic also was at a point where they had to think about new uh, revenue streams and, and new business models. So the decision was made to establish the Oyster Lab uh, with the goal to pursue consumer business opportunities. So everything we do is consumer, 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 and we build basically startups. So that's why we call it an incubator. I call it a clean tech incubator because all the products that we develop, all the startups that we develop have technology at the core that ideally helps to reduce the negative impact on the environment. Maybe a bit fuzzy, but uh, that's what we call a clean tech incubator. And as a team, we hope uh, with the products that we develop that we can make the world a greener place. So this is what motivates and drives us. Uh, we have a couple of superpowers that we, that we employ to turn ideas into, into business models. Um, so you're probably aware on the left hand side of the you know, T-shaped organization. So we have these, these roles, we have engineers, we have uh, experts in user research and human-centered design, and we have business people who can turn uh, ideas into business models, so people who know everything about energy business models or e-commerce business models. Uh, we have a team of 15, so it's interdisciplinary, and on the right-hand side we have different uh, tools and methodologies um, to test our assumptions, because what we do is basically we, we develop ideas, we have a lot of uh, hypotheses, and we want to test them both qualitatively and qualitatively in the most uh, inexpensive and in the fastest way possible. So we're talking about design thinking, startup, and 
engine and software development. And uh, I'm not going to read this uh, out loud. Uh, this, these are just some of the team members. Um, and this is what I'm particularly proud about. Uh, it's, a, it's a diverse team, so we don't only have mixed roles, but we also try to maintain a gender balance, and we have people from different uh, cultural backgrounds, or with different cultural backgrounds. So right now it's a small team, we have 12, but we are still hiring, so it will be a team of 15 to 17, and yeah, we try to have all the spices in the book, <laughs> because I think it's important to have that, to, you know, in, in order to be creative and have people with different uh, different ways of solving problems. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is the, the lead customer development process. Um, it's also uh, yeah, derived from the from the from the lean startup book. If you want to learn more about this, Pure Dojo is exactly the place for that. I will go through this real quick. So every single project is following this process. Uh, we have four phases that we time box. So every project um, takes between six to twelve months. In the first phase, we, uh, or what you see is actually two big phases. There's the search phase and the execution phase. Because every, every project has two main hypotheses that we need to validate. There's the value hypothesis uh, with the question of whether we can create value for a given customer segment. And assuming that we have, or that we're able to create value, there's the second hypothesis, namely the growth hypothesis. Uh, whether we can grow fast enough in the market because you can create a great, great product, but if it takes you 10 years to gain significant traction in the market, forget it, just to go into the trash bin. So these are the two phases, and they also work very differently because on the left hand side we are more in a search mode. We have to search the customer, we have to search the idea and the possible um, solution. And then on the right hand side, the execution phase is more about, okay, we have the product, we have to build it, we have to build it fast, we have to scale, we have to find partners, uh, we have to serve customers. So these are two modes in which we operate, and this creates a lot of complexity or a challenge in our organization. So going through real quick, first phase we start with the question, okay, who's the customer? Uh, who, whom are we going to serve? And uh, which problems does this uh, customer have? What is the pain that the customer has? And is it, does it make sense for us, does it make sense for Alpic to solve this problem? Can we leverage uh, an existing uh, competence of the, of the company to, to address this? What is the solution? Would the solution work on paper? And this is a constant search and, and, and struggle. Um, then on the, in the next phase, assuming that we have a customer and a pain, uh, we, we build a small prototype of the product and we try to find out whether our product is actually uh, providing a solution and whether, let's say, a handful of customers are willing to pay for the solution. And you see it's, uh, there are a lot of, this is an iterative phase, so there's a lot of pivoting here um, until we have found a good match. And assuming that we have a match, we then try to create or enter the customer creation phase. So can we we have we have the first five paying customers. Can we turn them into, or can we get 500 paying customers? Um, and based on the data that we then gather, are we making profits? Because in the beginning we don't know this yet. And are there any partners that can help us to access the market? And how does it grow uh, later on? And assuming that we have, let's say, 100 or 500 customers, we then enter the company building phase. So this is when we as the oyster lab try to transition it away because we cannot host projects like this forever so the ultimate goal is to create a new company a new startup and we just transition everything away maybe we hire a new team we have to scale the organization we have to scale operations um, and yeah maybe attract investors to to invest into this business so in a nutshell everything we do is validated learning because we're constantly uh, testing our assumptions um, so this is the, the build, measure, learn feedback loop. Um, who knows this? Just okay. So I don't have to explain too much, but it starts usually with uh, with an idea. Um, so we have hypotheses. For instance, okay, I have a product idea, and I just believe that this will address a uh, problem. Then we use this test card. Uh, it's a strategizer template um, to to basically describe our hypotheses and how we intend to to validate uh, this. Then we build a little test. Um, 
data comes in, we, we document that on a learning card, and based on the learnings, we make our decisions. So based on the data, we make our decisions how to move forward. Um, a little bit of uh, bullshit bingo or buzzwords. So uh, a lot of uh, interesting sounding keywords. So this is basically where man many energy companies are just trying to find uh, interesting ideas. Um, not going to mention all of them. Here are some technologies uh, about which we just need to have an opinion, like blockchain, for instance, or IoT, AI, and, and so on. Um, but right now we're more down here. We're working on, on electric mobility and also about, uh, on some new transportation concepts because that will be a big growth market and uh, also a huge business enabler for, for energy companies moving forward. Sorry. What is a prosumer? So prosumer is um, a user of uh, solar, solar uh, or, or, or photovoltaic, so someone who has, who has solar panels on the roof, and he's both consuming uh, the energy but also providing the energy back to the grid. So these are the, the prosumers. It's actually a good question because um, that is the first uh, target segment with, with which we uh, started at the Ostelab. Um, very quickly, so each project is a startup. Um, so we have, um, first of all, we have typical roles that you would find in the Scrum team, but also later on roles that resemble more or less um, departments in a company. So we need product owner or a CEO, we have a Scrum master, uh, and then the other roles that I mentioned, but also later on we need, um, let's say, someone who, who generates growth or traffic for our, for our prototypes. But this is just in a nutshell. Then um, we, we are very agile, and some of these tools and methodologies derive from 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 Zalando, um, where uh, yeah we, for instance, use OKRs, objectives and key results, to plan on a quarterly basis, and they usually connect to the annual objectives that we that we define together with the stakeholders. But those are not very granular the annual goals. So right now our goal is. Uh, to find one oyster, uh, or to make one oyster successful. That's why the oyster lab is called Oyster Lab, because you have to open many oysters to find the pearl. And we want to find one pearl this year. Namely, we want one product that has the potential to be transitioned away, to become a startup organization with the potential eventually to make a profit. Um, then we have to think hard, okay, what, which project do we believe has the highest potential of becoming this, this pearl? Um, so then we uh, use OKRs, and then we just work in, in regular or with regular release sprints or release cycles. Uh, one release uh, is one month, and then we have sprints. One sprint is one week. Uh, and then we just have our uh, typical agile rituals. We perform daily standups and so on. Uh, yeah, this is what it looks like. It's a bit, it's a bit messy. Um, but it's constant work in progress, so it will never be beautiful because we change the board on a regular basis. Um, yeah, some tools that you know. So we work very, very uh, visually. On the left-hand side, you see possible sharpies, and um, we have some tools that help us maintain discipline. So we are <laughs> time boxing, and we also have the blah blah cards. Um, that Stefan helped us to, to introduce, so whenever somebody is talking too much, uh, you just pull the card um, to stop the discussion and then you have to, to make a suggestion what tool you want to use to, to structure the, the conversation. <laughs> and we have our moose call. <laughs> <laughs> so when this sounds, everybody knows, okay, we have a meeting or we have a stand up. Um, so Jan brought this from Canada. It's just one of the ridiculous rituals that we have. <laughs> we always try to find new ridiculous things. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, continuous improvement uh, is very essential. So we maintain a culture of, of learning and continuous improvement. We give each other feedback. So 360 degree feedback is very important. We have regular retrospectives. We have a team health check every week. And we try after each meeting to do the so-called voting check, so return on time invested. We just ask, okay, on a scale from, what is it, one to five, how, how much value have you gained from this particular meeting? Three is break even, five is awesome, and one is meh. 
in der Tasche, in der Tasche gebaut ist. Und das ist how we continue to improve. Team communication use Slack in Google Drive. Um, and yeah, we have a very, I would say, very healthy team culture. So um, you see here the, the, the what is it, formula that we did. Um, then we, we do hiking. This is something we have planned. So we have regular team events and uh, what is it, milking session. <laughs> <laughs> we like to play Mario Kart and, and uh, table soccer and we also have our little office stuff down there. So, um, I think this was it on the, on the Oyster Lab front. So just to explain to you how we work and how we maintain like our innovation operating system and culture. And uh, now on the Project Juka. So basically the Oyster Lab opened its door in June, July last year. And um, for some time we yeah, just took us some time to ramp up the team and to establish all the processes that I just talked about. But at some point we had to work on the first project. So what you see here is just the beautiful green field that we found. And uh, we didn't know, we didn't quite know what to do because the Alpic as an organization didn't provide any, um, any, any baseline, any, uh, any yeah, starting point. So what we defined was that we have one, one mission to go after, and that is to, to gain access to the digital house, uh, ideally with a digital solution. Uh, why is that? Well, Alpic is selling energy to consumers, so uh, they already have a link to, to houses. Uh, and Alpic has a very strong footprint in uh, photovoltaic, so the consumer business, because Alpic is a market leader in selling and maintaining um, solar roofs. So there is a little, little link to the consumer, and we thought, okay, what, what can we do for these people who are already connected to Alpic to either buy more solar or buy solar in the first place? How can we convert uh, other consumers to, to buy the service? Um, so yeah, so what is the, who is the consumer or the customer and what, what problems do they, uh, do they have? So the first thing we did was to go out and, and talk to these people. So on the left you, you see a house with solar. We found these people on, on Google Earth. So we were just looking. For, for CO2 friendly uh, residential areas, so we just zoomed in and tried to find houses with solar. And then we just drove there uh, early in the morning and we were standing there at 8 or 9 p.m. It was foggy, it was cold, it was really stupid. And everybody was wondering what we were doing there because I think it was three guys with a, with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> and we just ran there. So these, these were not Alpec customers, people. these were just random people uh, who didn't have an appointment. And then we just asked, uh, you have solar on your roof, uh, why and since when and would you do it again? Do you have any problems with that? And first the people were really skeptical, uh, so they said, no, I don't have time, please go away. And we said, okay, just give us three minutes. And these three minutes easily turned into 90 uh, because people were opened up and they were really happy that, that um, finally someone is not trying to sell something to them, but just asking if they have any, any problems. So we realized that there are two, two groups of people who use solar. And on one hand, you have the, we call them the self-consumers. So they produce energy and they try to use 100% of the self-produced energy for themselves. So when the sun is shining, that's very easy. But at night, when there's no sunlight, that's very difficult. So what they need is a battery to store the energy or to have large consumers so that they can use as much energy as possible, ideally when the sun is shining. And then on the other hand, you have people who produce energy, but they sell 100% back to the grid. And this is how they make money. So one segment is making money by selling energy. The other group is saving money by using their own energy. But for both groups, it's all about money. It's only about return on investment. Because at some point in their lives, they make a decision, I will buy solar, and how many years does it take me to regain that money? It's not about being green, it's not really about being independent from the grid. This is something we found out, because everybody before told us, these people want to be green, they want to be independent. No, this is only about return on investment. So we realized um, this is a financial product, and the competing product is any other financial vehicle that you can get from a bank with, an, with a similar hour, a return on investment. 
So it's not sexy, it's not emotional, and it's not what we wanted to do because we don't want to sell investment products. But we realized it's always the same people. It was always the same people opening the door. It was always these young families with two kids, 0.5 dogs, uh, two cars, and they had a relatively new building with the, with the technology on the roof. And uh, we realized, well, they are at a very interesting point in their lives because they're just investing into the house, they have kids, they're, they're uh, concerned about their future, they have a high internet affinity, they're connected, they're social. So what, what can we do to them? Or what can we, what can we do for them? And we realized, well, if we focus on the, on the large consumer in the household, and if we focus on the bad way, and actually on the mobility needs, why don't we just sell them the electric car? Because electric car is the gateway drug. If you are these people in the middle, and you have the electric car in the house, you want solar, and vice versa. If you have the house and solar, then the electric vehicle just makes perfect sense. And then we asked them, what would need to happen for you to buy an electric vehicle? And then, again, there were two groups of people. One group said, and this is a quote, an electric vehicle is my dream. So this is what they said. But the, the car dealer around the corner won't sell it to me. He wants to sell me a combustion engine because uh, he's, he thinks that electric vehicles are bad and think about the precious metals in Africa and the whole situation. Of course he said that because car dealers are not incentivized to sell these cars because they make money by maintaining cars, doing oil exchange, uh, brakes ex exchange and all that kind of shit. And on the other hand, uh, you had people that said, well, um, what about the range and expense? Uh, what about the remaining value after three to four years? And battery technology is still emerging. Um, charging is a pain. Kilo what? I don't know what you want. Please go away. So we realized um, there is a supply issue, but there's also a demand issue based on fake news. Because we realized, well, when you drive an electric vehicle, it actually makes sense, at least for these people. Maybe not for everybody, but for, for these people with their mobility needs, it would make sense. So we framed this challenge. We wanted to remove entry barriers to electric mobility for millennial families or millennial motorists in rural and suburban areas. So it's only about people living on the countryside or in the periphery of a city. And maybe you know car sharing services like, like Drive Now. They have a limit. Uh, and people living outside the service area would be, would be perfect for, for this kind of, uh, for the electric vehicle at least. So, just some uh, comments about the picture. So we did an immersion, so we rented all different uh, electric vehicles, because nobody in the team has ever driven one, didn't know anything about it. And here you see Wojtek from the team, he's sitting in the back, kind of mim <laughs> mimicking a <the> child. <laughs> um, and then we had a lot of brainstorming sessions and we collected a lot of insights from, from, the, from the people that we interviewed and some, some posters here. And then we developed some stories and shuffled them around and this is called a canvas here on top. So at some point we thought, okay, we have, we have a solution. So what's the solution and does it solve the problem? That was the question. And this is what the solution concept was all about. I call it Netflix for electric mobility. Uh, so it's a subscription-based complete package, uh, including the car, the public charging app, so I can charge my electric car wherever I am in the public, and a home charger for my home. And on, uh, on top of that, you get all the electricity that you need uh, to drive, um, and you can cancel the subscription on a monthly basis. And why is this cool? Because first of all, if I don't know if electric mobility is for me, I can just subscribe to this, and if I realize tomorrow that it doesn't work, then I can just return the car and go back to my normal life. Um, and if I have anxiety about the cost, because I don't know what the remaining value is, or how much charge it costs, it doesn't really matter, because you just pay one price, and, and you're mobile with the electric car. So easy in, easy out, and we call it Juka um, because we wanted to have a snackable short domain name, and Juka stands for juice and car, so energy and car combined. Uh, so this was the idea, um, and then we wanted to test whether people actually like this. So we developed an MVP, minimum viable product. We wanted to create the experience as quickly as possible. 
So we tested all different sorts of apps. We tested, again, more cars and a home charger. We opened it, looked inside. We built our own. So this is Stefan here. He's actually, he actually has a, has a background uh, as an electrician. So he's, he's allowed to fiddle around with this stuff. <laughs> um, then, yeah, this is the first version of the customer journey. And this is Miss G. <laughs> I think I don't, I'm not allowed to mention her name anymore because of uh, data protection, but she's the first customer. So she's the first, uh, first uh, mother uh, in southern Germany who received everything. So she got the app, she got the, the charging station, the car, uh, the energy, and uh, a lot of homework from us. So we gave her homework and a logbook, and we had frequent calls with her, and uh, we also onboarded her, so it's Christian and Martina here in the back. And uh, they handed over the car and explained everything, how the car works, how does charging work, how does the app work. And uh, then she drove the, the car for, for three weeks and we learned a lot about how customers would interact with the product. And this we did with, with 10 different families in southern Germany to learn a lot. But we didn't sell it to them uh, because that was the next question. So we realized uh, after getting the feedback that we had a, a good compelling offer but would people actually pay for this now. So what is the product? Um, or what is also the price tag? Because we didn't ask the families how much would you pay. That was the next, the next challenge. So we developed another MVP to test the so-called product market fit in a quantitative way. So we didn't want to test with, with a handful of families. We wanted to test with hundreds of users. So we just built this website. Uh, we sent in like a standard e-commerce funnel. So we had a website. Um, the left hand side to create awareness, so this explains in simple terms what is the product, what are the features, what are your, uh, what's your advantage, and then you can click on it, you can configure um, your, your bundle, then you have a um, yeah, address form, thank you page, and at the end we wanted something, not money, but something personal from the, from the customers that was a little bit of a pain for them to provide. So we asked for a signed reservation agreement and a copy of the uh, driver's license. And with this, this is actually an iterative process. So this is the, the final version that we have right now, but it took us a while to build this because we tested all different cars, we tested different prices, we tested different features and the combination of features until we reached a point where we had like the optimal conversion because this was the most important point. Uh, we, want, we didn't want, or we didn't need so many here. What we wanted to learn was about the KPIs down here. So how many people access the page, then how many people click on this, how many people click on each individual bundle, how many people submit the form, etc., etc. Why, why did we do this? Because with this, we learned exactly what the so-called customer acquisition cost would be. So we used Google AdWords and banner campaigns down here on August 24 to generate traffic, and then we, we, we just learned, okay, if we spend 1,000 bucks, how many people will end up here? And at some point, we reached a stable number, which was always uh, repetitive. Um, and then we were basically done with this, and then we cont contacted partners and told them, or car manufacturers, and we told them, well, we have 100 standing offers, or 100 standing reservations. Let's build this shit. Um, and then we told them this, where we have discovered the ideal, ideal product uh, through A-B testing. So you see that we have two products actually. So we, one is Juka Drive, the blue um, lanes, and, and Juka Charge is the red one. So in the, in the highest uh, configuration, it includes what I mentioned before, the, the vehicle, the charging app, and the home charger, including the flat rate but you can also get everything excluding the car. So if you already have the electric vehicle, you can just get the flat rate and the charging um, option. So can we make money with this? Uh, is there a business model behind this? Um, so we didn't, we didn't collect any money here. We just have 100 reservations, so we don't know yet whether we will be making money. Especially we don't know what, what it will cost to serve the product. Um, of course, we already gained some, some insights here because we already built it and we served it, which, by the way, took only six weeks from first idea to, to, to this day for six weeks. Um, so, how do we make, how do we make, uh, do we make profit as the business model? 
So we have this right now, yep. so we have a business model. Um, but what are the numbers? So I'm not reading this out loud. Uh, I think you know the canvas. So we have to test different, different elements of this. And most importantly, we have to test, again, what is the cost of capture? So how much money do we have to spend to get one customer? How much money does it take or, or cost to deliver the product? And what is the retention rate? So how long will the customer stay subscribed to our product? And once we have these three numbers, we can make a projection into the future. And we know, okay, in five years, in 10 years, with this car or with that car, we will make profit or not. So what we're doing now, we will deliver uh, the cars. We're actually working with the BMW i3 and the Nissan Leaf in two countries. So in this quarter, in May, we will start delivering to Swiss customers and to German customers. And we will start with a limited number uh, together with, with our partners. And then we will conduct a performance evaluation at the end. So after three months, we will look at the numbers. And if we like what we see, we continue. So there will be another three months with more cars. Um, and then if we, if we see, well, there's potential to make a profit at some point, we enter the company building phase. And then we try to start a new company, transition everything away. We have customers, and uh, the Oyster Lab says goodbye and we do something else. So again, as a reminder, here we have to ask ourselves what's the new home, who's investing into this, how do we scale this, and how much does it actually cost us to let go, because we have to hire a new team, we have to transition the knowledge, etc., etc. Um, yeah, and right now that's our biggest challenge. We have to become operational, so you can imagine a team that normally pursues ideas and this prototype is not the perfect team to design processes and, and, and do all that uh, stuff that a large enterprise would do. But this is, this is both a challenge but also a lot of fun because we get to work on very uh, versatile things. Um, so right now what we're doing is we're finalizing the, the customer journey and the service blueprint. We have to design a lot of processes because we have partners on board and we have to kind of manage and visualize the complexity. We're working on the, on the brand because what you saw on the, on the slides was just a prototype. So something we hacked together real quick. And now we're actually taking uh, some, some money uh, so to design a proper brand design for the vehicle, for the app, for the website and so on. And we have to, you can see it anymore, uh, we have to prepare all the legal documents and contracts and, uh, in two countries. So that's a challenge. Uh, yeah, I think that was it. So thank you very much. But also, um, as a call to action, please stay. Uh, let's let's stay in touch. So I'm very uh, interested to, to to get your feedback. Um, please subscribe to our Instagram, and we are hiring. So we're looking still for engineers, mobile engineer, uh, product people. We are still looking, uh, looking for working students. So please have a look at our website. And uh, yeah, that's that's the talk. Thanks. Nice.